As we begin the conversation on morality and ethics, we look at the first principle of it, which is the law of human nature. This law, which is, appears to be universal and drives the adherence to some unknown specified constant, much like the law of gravity. And it's helpful to think about this in terms of the physical laws, that you have a natural law that applies only to mankind, and you have another law that applies to the physical items of the universe, the, the items that have souls like trees and cats and birds and dogs, but have to obey certain laws, just like we do. So we have to obey all the laws of nature, but there's a human law, there's a, there's a law of human nature, which we alone are required to obey. And you see this evident in the conversation between a couple of children who maybe one of them takes a piece of candy away from the other, and the other one says, okay, I gave you some of my candy, now it's only fair that I take some of your candy. You see, there's this idea of fairness pent up in humanity that somehow we agree without even discussing it, this idea of fairness, this idea of, a, of an inborn rule through which we mediate our conversations, our business dealings, and our relationships. So what we're saying is that not merely are we saying that there's a certain type of behavior that's pleasing to other people, it's a societal thing. What we're saying is that there's some sort of standard of behavior, this universal standard of behavior, which all other people expect all other people that they come across to know about. So there's a standard by which we obey or we, we are aware of, and there's a standard which we also expect everyone else to know about. This idea of, of fairness. And you very, very rarely hear of someone saying, to hell with your standards, as Lewis puts it. To, to not, I'm not gonna obey the, this law. It's not respectful or this isn't fair or I'm going to not agree that two plus two equals four. I'm gonna say two plus two equals five. And so this idea of logical fallacy is something that is, that is pushed away because of this law of human nature that's inborn within each of us. Now, if we don't wanna obey the law in a certain circumstance, we will always find an excuse for which not to obey the law. And what's interesting about excuses is that we set up a higher standard than the moral law through which we would assent and we say that this overarches the moral law. Or we'll, even better yet, we'll take another element of the moral of human law in order to apply that it supersedes somehow, some way because of the conditions. And so we find these excuses. And what's interesting about excuses is you always make excuses and you only make excuses for poor behavior, for things that are unbecoming of a wise human. But we never make excuses for our good actions. We know the good actions are a result of our moral character, we want people to assume. But the bad actions, those are not a result of our moral character. Those, are bad, those bad actions are something that you're misinterpreting. This is the excuse in there. And so this is the very definition of a fight, of a quarrel, of a dispute, is that one man is trying to show the other man that he's wrong. And there's no sense in doing that unless both people agreed to some sort of standard definition of what right and wrong is. A heavyweight boxer tries to challenge the reigning world championship holder. He tries to challenge to prove that he's stronger, that he's a better boxer. And also that there's some truth to this idea of the ascent to power through taking down the dominant leader. There's something, something right and wrong about that. But there's no reason for them to fight unless there's a standard, a moral standard bent in there. The standard of, moral, of fair play and decent behavior or morality. Now, they used to call this the, the law of right and wrong or the law of nature or the law of morality. And what they, what they mean by this is that if you look at other laws, the law of gravity, and you compare this with the law of human nature, what we see is that the law of human nature, this law of ethics, this law of morality, is the only law which a human can either freely choose to obey or to disobey. I cannot choose to disobey the law of gravity, the laws of physics, the laws of science and biology. I cannot di choose to disobey the fact that two plus two always equals four, even though I really would like it to be five. And I can find plenty of excuses why it actually is five. But with morality and fair use and fair play, we have this idea that it's something that we could choose to obey or we could choose to disobey. And so what we do is we see that mankind is subjected through various types of laws and various types of considerations 
all at one time, but there's only one of these laws which he is free to obey or disobey. This is the law of human nature. He cannot disobey the laws which he shares in common with all the other things of earth, the rocks and the trees and the birds. But the one single law that he doesn't share with anyone else, that of anything else on the earth, the one single law that he can choose to obey is that one law that's uniquely human. And this law of nature is called that because by nature, everyone knows what the law is and they don't need to be taught it. Now, we find these counter arguments as well as possible. Some would say that the law of morality is something that, that's socially constructed or it's, it's bent out of this religious mythology or this mythos that has come around for, through the ages. But this isn't true. Because when we think about a total morality, we think about maybe the alternative. We think about a country that may be a little bit different. And you've never seen a country where a man was credited for running away in battle and cowardice. You've never seen a country where they would say two plus two equals five. You've never seen a country or a business dealing where a man was proud for double crossing another man. No, all of these elements are pent up in the idea of what it means to be a human, that you should confine yourself to the actions and the orient to the morality that we share with mankind. Lewis uses this example. He says that in all the worlds, you might have societies that say, it's okay for you to have one wife. Some might say you might, it's okay for you to have two or three or four wives. But in no society do you find the idea that you can have any woman you want. This is a commonality among all the moral frameworks of the world. And this tells us that no matter if you go back and you look at the moral teachings and say the ancient Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Hindus, the Chinese, the Greeks, the Romans, the Judeo-Christian ethic, you'll see they're all very, very much the same. And so you find this man who's making the excuses, who says that he does not believe in a real right or wrong, or that it's a, it's a social construct. You see him say that in one moment. In the very next moment, you present a logical fallacy to test him. He'll say at the same moment, going back on this moment later, that he can break his promise to you, but you better not break your promise to him. He can have a logical fallacy or infallacy with this concept of moral law, but you better not have an illogical constructed sentence. You see, he's holding you to a standard which he himself is trying to say that he doesn't agree to. And so it seems that we're really forced, that we're constrained by this real right and real wrong, this, this moral law. And that's not just a, a taste, a mere opinion of how we should live or moral construct or the feelings that we have. It's something more like a multiplication table. It's something more like something that we have to obey. And here's the interesting thing, that we're not only obligated to obey, we feel this within ourselves and we know how everyone else should obey, but we also choose to disobey. In fact, none of us are really keeping this moral law. It's the only law that we can choose to not keep and we don't keep. All the other laws we must keep, and we so we do keep, but the only one law that applies only to humans is also the law for which we are unable to, quit, to keep. This is why we have excuses. And so we find these excuses in that we, we tend to believe that if we have a good enough excuse, we can abdicate our responsibility to the moral law. This, this idea that they want this idea of, of, a, of a proof of a law, of something that can be untranscendable, that it cannot be transcended by anything greater. But we find ourselves in another really, really curious place that we'll talk about in depth in a later segment, and that we have the ability to obey or to disobey, that we know what the right thing to do is and something to disobey. And this, this idea that we could disobey, and we choose to disobey many times, the moral law. But we find ourselves in a situation that these two things cannot govern themselves. So there must be a higher moral standard, a greater good, a greater judge that then tells us 
that this is right and this is wrong, that we must run into the fire to save the children, not run and flee out into the night for personal safety. We find heroism because the fireman wants to run into the fire instead of running away from it. A great warrior runs into the fight instead of hiding in the ditch. This idea of heroism, this idea of virtue, this idea of a more cultured society where we sent to the higher, we sent to the true, we sent to the noble, is something that only comes about because there is a standard over which the moral law or the disobedience of the moral law judges. And so we feel this, this law of morality pressing in on us. And we try to shift the responsibility with excuses. And so we make excuses for our bad behavior, but we accept personal aggrandizement for our good behaviors. The good behaviors, the good morality is something that just becomes out of our becoming. It is a part of our essence. We are just naturally good. We want others to think. That's why we act good. Oh, but but the, the moral abdication, the moral eclipse where we maybe take the lesser noble road. We take the road that's easiest. That we find excuses for. And so we put our good temper, we put our good attributes down to ourselves and we put the excuses down to our logic we can logical way out of the moral law. Yet we all know that that is a fallacy. And so we find these two points as human beings. These two points that, that curiosity, curiosity has it that we have in ourselves this some sort of standard, this standard where we know that we and everyone else should obey. We should obey the rules of logic, the rules of love, the rules of that we should have, not have any woman that we want, but we should have a one wife or two wives or three wives or four wives in the, in the, in the various traditions. But we find this at play. And the second thing we find is that there's this idea of morality, this moral law that's special among all human beings and that is universal among all, all human beings, but also we're unable to assent to it. We're un unable to maintain it. And so this, these two are the foundations of all the clear thinking about ethics, about ourselves, about how the universe functions, that there is a moral law in which we all live, but we're all unable to keep.